session we're going to go over leases. Now the state exam has a lot of questions on residential leases and a few on commercial. So let's start on residential leases. We first need to make a distinction between a few types of estates that fall under leasehold estates. So if you remember, freehold estates were ownership of real property. Leasehold estate, it's an interest in real property, but not ownership, right? When you have a lease, you have an interest in real property, you have a contractual right to physically possess it, the right of possession, although you don't own it. So under leasehold estates, the first type I want you to know is estate for years. Now, the estate for years, any type of question to give you on that, I want you to know that it's for fixed time. So if you lease a property for four months, it's still an estate for years. If you lease a property for six years, it's still an estate for years. What makes an estate for years is that it's a fixed time, a fixed amount of time, meaning there's a beginning and an end, right? Now, an estate for period to period. This, it's not a fixed amount of time because it could keep going month to month. It's ongoing. We don't really know when it's over until either the landlord or the tenant gives 30 day notice. So if you get a question that Bob's renting a property month to month, what type of estate does he have? An estate for period to period. How do you end an estate for period to period? 30 day notice. Now you don't have to give it a, a 30 day notice on this estate for years because it's given in the con on the contract itself. The lease itself says this lease terminates on December 31st or March 15th. You're already stating the end. Whereas period for period, you don't, never know when it's end until one of you gives the 30 day notice. So see if that helps you keep it straight. It stayed for years, fixed amount of time, there's a beginning and end. It stayed for period to period, it's ongoing, a month to month. So it does require that either the landlord or the tenant give the other a 30 day notice. Another one we need to know about is called an estate at will. Kind of like an estate for period to period, except no 30 day notice is required. They could terminate it at any moment, which is why this is not allowed in California, because we have landlord tenant laws and one of the laws says that no, you can't just knock on the door and throw the tenant out. There must be a 30 day notice. So estate at will, no notice required, but this not allowed in California. And then we have this estate at sufferance. This is when a tenant has stayed beyond the lease term. So they entered into it lawfully. However, they've now stayed beyond the lease term against the landlord's wishes. So we say the estate is suffering, at least the landlord is. Now what's the cure? What's the remedy for the landlord? Well, they're going to have to sue the tenant to get that right of possession returned back. So they file a legal action called an unlawful detainer action, or sometimes it's called a UD file. So once they file that, if they win this lawsuit, they'll be given back the right of possession that they gave the tenant. Once they get that, they can now give that to the sheriff and then the sheriff can perform the eviction. So when a tenant has stayed beyond the lease term against the landlord's wishes, we say it's an estate at sufferance. What's the cure or remedy? Not eviction, it's a lawsuit first called an unlawful detainer action, which hopefully results in the eviction. However, the tenant could fight it, could dispute it, those type of things. Okay. Now let's talk about security deposits. So let's talk about security deposits. So in California, we are limited how much we can charge based on what we say statute or by law. So if a unit is unfurnished, if a unit is unfurnished, actually I'm going to bring this back here. If a unit is unfurnished, you can charge up to two times the monthly rent. So let's say this house is unfurnished and it's renting for 5,000 per month. The max 
security deposit would be ten thousand if it is unfurnished. So if it's unfurnished, the max you could charge is ten thousand. Now that doesn't mean you have to. It's two times a month. You want to charge a dollar or zero, that's perfectly fine. But of course, you want to charge enough to protect your client's interest or your own interest if you're the landlord. Now, if it is furnished, if it is furnished, then you can go three times the monthly rent. So in this scenario, you could charge up to 15000 for a security deposit. So what determines the amount of security deposit you can charge, whether the unit is furnished or unfurnished. If it's unfurnished, up to two times the monthly rent. If it's furnished, up to three times the monthly rent. Not anymore. Now, these are maximums, not minimums. So you can charge, like you see those apartments that say, move in special, $300, and the rent's 1000 a month. That's, that's fine. What these statues are is maximums on security deposits. So, what determines the amount of security deposit a landlord can charge on a residential rental, whether it's furnished or unfurnished? Make sure you keep that straight. If it's unfurnished, up to two times the monthly rent. If it's furnished, up to three times the monthly rent. Now, how long does the landlord have to return your security deposit upon lease termination? 21 days to return that deposit or an itemized receipt with the balance. So 21 days, itemized, and it's a hard 21 days. If they don't return within 21 days, they're not allowed to deduct anything, and they might even be subject to three times the security deposit penalty if they don't. So on the state exam, how many days do they have to return the deposit? 21 days. A term I need you to know, abandonment. If the tenant just moves out early, just leaves, we say they've abandoned the lease, abandonment. And if the lease does not say you can't, then you can sublease or assign. So maybe you have a lease and you want to rent out the back bedroom to your friend to help pay the rent. If the lease does not have any language in it that says you can't, then you can. However, most professional leases will say subject to landlord approval or something to that effect. But for some reason, the lease does not say you can't, then you can. Okay, let's talk about some commercial lease terms, some commercial lease terms. Let me, let me just make if, a, if a landlord's gonna charge you a flat amount, then we say it's a gross lease, a gross lease. If the landlord says, hey, it's 4,000 a month or 2,000 a month, that's it, that's a gross lease. If the landlord's gonna charge you a base rent plus a percentage, of your gross sales, that's a percentage lease. So, and, and keep in mind, it's gross sales, not your net. So you may, may not make any money and still get charged a percentage of your gross, which is good for the landlord, not good for you. If you go to shopping malls like Westfield Shopping Mall, that's the type of lease you're gonna get. You're gonna get a percentage lease where the landlord, so this is a, com a commercial lease, not residential, you're going to get a charge, probably a base rent plus a percentage of your gross sales. A net lease, very common, I'm in a net lease right here in my office building where I have to pay all three of the owner's expenses. So I pay a base rent plus a portion of the property taxes, insurance, and maintenance often called CAM, Common Area Maintenance. So I have a triple net lease. But maybe if the landlord said, hey, you only have to pay the maintenance, I would have a single net lease. Or if I only paid two of these, a double net lease. Or unfortunately in my case, like I pay all three, so it's a triple net lease. Now very often the landlord might give the tenant some allowance for improvements because the landlord wants to keep you there, especially in commercial. In residential, people want to sign a month a month, they want to sign a year maximum, but keep in mind that in commercial, you're spending a lot of money to move your business, to get it just right, so the landlord knows this and they might give you some TI money, some tenant improvement money. Landlord will contribute some monies towards your tenant build out 
so that you stay, right? Because you can say, oh, if I rebuild this store or this coffee shop, it's better for me to just stay than take on the expense. So for the state exam, what is TI? Tenant improvements, tenant improvements. Okay, a couple other things I want to review with you under the leases. A sale and lease back is just a term that refers to you selling your building, right? You sell it and then you lease back. Now, why would you do that? Because maybe you own the building and the business and you need the money but you can't move the building or move the location because you really need it for your business. So you say, well, let me cash out some money by selling the building and then sign a long-term lease so that my business can stay there because maybe that location is very important to your business. And it's a win-win because the investor, the income buyer, loves buying a property that has a built-in tenant and the tenant, which used to be the seller, the tenant now, right? You used to be the seller, now you're the tenant, loves the fact that he doesn't have to relocate. He can take the capital from his business, uh, from his office building or retail building, whatever real estate he sold, put into his business as he needs it and lease back. So that's a sale and lease back, a sale and lease back. Okay. Now. Let's talk a little bit about the income approach to appraisals. And it kind of fits here under leases, so I'm going to talk about it here. So an appraiser that's appraising some kind of income producing property that's producing rent, right? That's what makes it income producing, that's producing rent has certain things they can use in their calculation of a capitalization rate or market value. So let's say this building's producing a gross rent of $100,000. Well, there are certain expenses a landlord's gonna have no matter what, even if they own the building cash. The first is property taxes, right? Every building is subject to property taxes. There might be some maintenance fees, some maintenance fees. And then insurance, insurance. There might also be some vacancy losses. So these are the only type of expenses for this type of income approach to appraisal that an appraiser would be able to deduct. And let's say all these things add up to $30,000, to $30,000, uh, he would deduct it from there and let's say this so make sure you have this so let's say we now have the hundred thousand minus the thirty thousand of expenses for a net operating income NOI is net operating income of seventy thousand dollars very similar to when you're valuing a business could really an income property is like a business there's certain expenses you're going to deduct from that business to get to what the actual net operating income is. In this case, we were able to deduct the property taxes, the maintenance, vacancy losses, and insurance to calculate net operating income. Now, the formula, we, we did no math on the state exam, so don't, don't start getting nervous. There's no math on the state exam, but we may need to know where these things fit. So we take the net operating income, we divide it by a desired rate of return, which is all a cap rate is, is a desired rate of return, rate of return to get market value, market value. So in this case, we got the net operating income, which was $70,000. And let's say we knew we wanted to get a 5% cap rate. Well, we would just divide. So 5% into 70,000, this has to become a decimal, 0.05, into 70,000 gives us a value of 1.4 million. So using the income approach, the appraiser would divide the net operating income by a desired rate of return to get market value, market value.
Okay. Keep in mind, you have these slides that I sent you. So you have these slides. I want you to review those. I want you to review this lesson. And you also have a 10, uh, actually, I, did, I give you 12 question quiz. So whip that out. And let's go over some of the questions. So number one, what is the maximum amount of secure deposit a landlord of an unfurnished residential apartment can demand? Two months rent. Not that the letter matters, but in this one, bravo. Two months rent. Question number two, a commercial lease that involves the tenant's gross sales as part of the rent is referred to as a alpha, a percentage lease. Remember that percentage lease, gross sales. Number three, a lease in which the tenant will pay some of the owner's expenses is referred to as a Bravo net lease. And if you're paying all three, triple net, one single net, two double net. A lease is a contract for possession, right? The owner of the property has a bundle of rights. And one of the rights they have is the right to be there called the right of possession. And in a lease, they're giving that right to the tenant, right? They're not giving the tenant the right to sell the house. They're not giving the tenant the right to borrow money against the house, but they are giving them one of their several rights that an owner has. Remember the rights and interest in the thing owned. One, the right to be there. So a lease is a contract for possession or interest in property that is less than the owner's, right? Because the owner has a lot more. It creates what type of estate for the tenant, we say less than a freehold estate, right? Freehold estate with ownership, less than a freehold estate would be a lease. Or they might have given you an answer, a leasehold estate. Either one would be right. But in this case, number four, the answer is bravo, less than a freehold estate. Number five, a lease, that piece of paper that's a contract between you and the landlord, right? The landlord is the lessor and you are the lessee if you're the tenant. What is that considered? Well, it's considered real property, chattel real, personal property, or chattel and personal. So that piece of paper is not real property. It's an interest in real. So we say it's personal property. But this word chattel, this is a, a tricky word they throw on the state exam sometimes, chattel. And if it helps you, think of cattle, right? Like cattle is a goat or a pig, and that's personal property. So a lease can be personal property, but if they use that word chattel, it, it could also be referred to as chattel. So the answer number six, I'm sorry, number five, a lease is considered personal property and chattel real, which would be the answer delta, both B and C. Which of the following is less than a freehold estate? We're on number six. Which of the following is less than a freehold estate? Bravo, a lease. A lease is less than a freehold estate. Number seven is just a statement of fact that you need to know. A resident live-in apartment manager is required for any building with 16 or more units. So if you have a huge apartment complex with 16 or more units, it requires a live-in manager, a live-in manager. 16 or more units, make sure you remember that. Number eight, a landlord must return to the security deposit or itemized receipt within how many days of terminating a lease? 21, good, 21 days. So number eight is Delta, 21 days. Number nine, the holder of a lease that subleases the property is said to have, so you have a lease and maybe you rent out part to someone else, you, you take their money, you put it with your money and then you give it to the landlord. We call that a sandwich lease. So number nine, alpha, a sandwich lease. Cause it's kind of like a sandwich. You're taking from here, you're in the middle, and there's a landlord, a sandwich lease. Number 10, an estate at sufferance, remember that, a tenant stayed beyond the lease term against the owner's wishes. It's created when a tenant wrongfully remains in possession of a property after the end of the term, a landlord must file a, what was that legal action? A Charlie unlawful detainer action or UD. Number 10 is Charlie UD. Number 11, Mr. Jones rents an office space for a term of nine months. Fixed amount of time. He has what type of estate? Would be an estate for years, an estate for years. 
which is a leasehold estate. So number 11 is Delta, a leasehold estate or estate for years, right? And number 12, this one's a statement of fact. It's just a statement of fact. How long can a residential lease be for? And it's 99 years. So how long can a lease be, like contractually? 99 years. Okay, that's our lease section. See you on the next one.